सो हाई गाइज गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर सुशील विजय दिस साइड आई एम योर ऑर्थोपेडिक फैकल्टी एट डी बी एम सी एंड डी गुरुकुल एंड टूडे वी आर हेयर इन दिस सेशन टू रिवाइज ऑर्थोपेडिक्स फॉर योर एफ एम जी एग्जाम ओके सो आई एल ट्राई टू कवर अप द मैक्सिमम थिंग्स एज मच आई कैन विच आर वेरी वेरी फ्रूटफुल एंड वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर योर अपकमिंग एग्जाम एंड बिलीव मी हेलो बॉस सो वी हैव द लिजेंड ऑफ एन एक्मी विद अस so watching me here hi boss hope you are doing well all right so uh, so the plan for the day would be that uh, you know all the previous year questions of your fmg exam whatever has been there uh, in last couple of years wo sare hum cover karne wale hain aur jo sabse zyada probable uh, questions hote hain hamare let's see kya uh, kya possibilities hain kis kis topic mein se kahan trauma se kahan infection se kaun sa splint kitni baar aaya hai so uh, let's try to do that as well All right, so I think uh, I'm live, audible, visible to all of you very, very clearly. So Ashwini sir has already confirmed it. So uh, I think we are uh, good to go. So uh, starting from very, very basic, बिल्कुल basic से शुरू करते हैं. Hi Sai, hi Ketan. Hope you are doing well. So uh, just wanted to know that how many FMG students are there in the session live, so that we can cover up whole orthopedics with your uh, involvement in the discussion part. All right, so uh, yeah, okay. So I'm not just starting now. So guys, the very first topic, the very simplest topic I have for you, from where the questions have been there in your previous years, is from the basics of about the bone. That what is the composition of the bone? How is the bone formed? So one question you know that whenever the bone is formed in our body, yeah. Hi, Monimala. Yeah. so whenever the bone is formed in the body you know that bone is formed of primarily two component one we called as organic matrix and one what you call as inorganic mineral in your previous years they have asked you about this question that what kind of collagen is present in the bone itself right so if you look at this organic matrix the organic matrix basically you know is made up of two component the cell and the protein and this cell which makes the bone is your osteoblast only and what this osteoblast secretes is the type 1 collagen the type 1 pro collagen so please mind that this was your mcq exam like mcq in your exam that what is a collagen which is there in the bones it is type 1 pro collagen now if they ask you about the type 2 collagen the type 2 collagen if they ask you about this so type 2 is basically present in the cartilages so please remember type 1 collagen in the bones and type 2 cart in the cartilages all right now minerals the major component of the bone 70% is made by the minerals and the mineral which makes up the bone is the calcium calcium in our body is present in variable forms right and one of the most important present is in the form of hydroxyapatite crystalline form right so calcium it is present as the hydroxyapatite crystalline form okay so one important question i told you type 1 pro collagen type 2 in the cartilage area uh, for monimala for neat pg we have already done the session last time and for the neat pg again we'll be doing it before the next neat pg so this is exclusive for fmg students uh, you know the session the simplest variant where the way in which the questions are being projected in the fmg exam so this is just a exam oriented kind of uh, recap session all right so yes if you wish to attend you will have the clarity in your concepts very well you can be a part of it okay that is the composition of the bone guys so type 1 type 2 procollagen now when you talk about uh, this one the different type of metabolic disorders you must have the clarity in your mind right you must have the clarity in your mind that how the metabolic disorders they are related to the very very basics of the bone how are they connected you know that bone are made up of three component or two component we said no the organic and inorganic so cell and its protein with the mineral are the three component which make the bone right now how these three components are related to the pathologies let's see that as well so cellular you know problems can be there protein problems can be there mineral problems can be there so three component making the bone now what are the problems you can very well see here when you talk about the cellular problems please mind it the cellular problem number 1 is pagets who is the culprit the culprit is always a osteoclast right the culprit is always a osteoclast because clast is a cell which is coming from monocyte macrophage family isn't it and this cell basically if it is working more trying to resolve the bone more it is seen in a condition called pagets and if the osteoclast is not working then it is called as osteopetrosis the marble bone disease all right this is the marble bone disease we call it so this one would be the marble bone disease okay that would be your marble bone disease 
Now, if, uh, if somebody asks you about the protein problem, there are two. One, if it is a genetic defect in the type 1 collagen, osteogenesis imperfecta. If it is a nutritional problem, then it is scurvy. And the mineral problem is rickets and osteomalacia that you already know very, very well. Isn't it? That you know, let me just uh, reduce the size a little bit because I think I am just covering some part of the screen. So, I would like to just reduce some part of it. Alright, so I think we are good to go now. Okay, so I think I'll be covering, yeah, I can understand, I can understand. I have just reduced my size, the picture, I, I was just looking at the same thing. Alright, so three problems we have, basically three components we have and these are six problems. Two problems in each of the pathologies, right? So in case in your exams, there is a question about the mineralization disorder that what happens to serum mineralization in rickets and malicia what happens to serum mineralization in rickets and malicia we know that has to be decreased but if they ask you what happens to serum mineralization in pigets in petrosis in osteogenesis imperfecta or scurvy then we know that that has to be absolutely all right that will be absolutely normal right so this is something you need to learn with time so just a moment i think there is some more settings i can change for you guys okay no issues so this is these are the three issues all right now if there is a question about the serum mineralization as i was saying they will be reduced only in two situations rickets and malicia and all the other four conditions will have no change in the serum mineralization please remember it two problem of cell two problem of minerals and two of the problems of the proteins okay, okay? now coming on to the markers which again has been a question in your exam that which one of these is a marker of a blastic activity which one of them is a marker of the blastic activity all right so marker of blastic activity now it is like this the marker of blastic activity i'll keep it uh, like small okay the mass the markers for the blastic activity the most important you have to remember it is a alkaline phosphatase all right and for the osteoclastic activity resorption of the bone please remember that it is a trap trap means what tartrate resistant acid phosphatase i think this picture would be uh, great now and you should be able to uh, now see everything behind me that would be fine so basically guys please remember this the tartrate resistant acid phosphatase okay tartrate resistant acid phosphatase so trap will be the one which will yeah now it is much much better i think so basically acidic media will be required for the resorption of the bone and the alkaline media for the formation of the bone Okay, that is very, very important thing to understand. Please remember it. So, I am just highlighting the MCQs which have been there in your previous year exams. Alright, next one. When you talk about the osteoporotic component, now how do we define osteoporosis? How do I define osteoporosis? How will that be defined? So, see, osteoporosis can be defined very, very simply as we needed two components to make the bone. One was your osteoid and one was your mineralization. We said, no, cell plus protein. Cell plus protein is the component number a that is what you call in short as osteoid and the component number b is the mineralization presuming that both are all all right presuming that both are normal the bone so form will be normal in case the osteoid component is okay but serum is not able to transfer the minerals then it is definitely a osteomalacia or the rickets and if the osteoid is not there the bony cells are not there then what happens if the bony cells are not there and the mineral definitely will be required less this is what you call osteoporosis so please remember one very very important point here that in osteoporosis in osteoporosis what happens to serum mineralization what happens to serum mineralization in osteoporosis i'll write just write down here that just here osteoporosis will always have a normal serum mineralization osteoporosis will have a normal serum mineralization all right it will have a normal serum mineralization all right so two components where the serum mineralization is normal is uh, normal is all the other situations other than only two conditions where it is low rickets and malicia right rickets and 
Malaysia. All right. Now this is some very good video I just found on uh, uh, Facebook only. Now see this is the relation that happens between the osteoblast and clast together. You all can see the blast is busy making the bone and the clast with the double speed is trying to resolve the bone. That is something something happens. So please remember decrease in mineralization is only seen in two situation rickets and Malaysia. Increase is not seen in any of these situations basically. It is only seen, the serum mineralization is only increasing in one situation that is hyperparathyroidism. Right? Hyperparathyroidism. Alright? Now, next one. This is, see, whenever a patient comes to you with the osteoporosis, the problem of osteoporosis, what kind of brace support do we give if there is a pain in the back area? So, this brace that you see on the screen is known as, it is known as the tailor's brace. Right? The brace support given to the patient for osteoporosis trauma of the dorsal spine for dorsal lumbar immobilization is what you call the Taylor's brace. All right, Taylor's brace. Next one, <coughs> the topic of osteoporosis. In the osteoporosis, please remember that the typical presentation of the vertebra, typical presentation of the vertebra would be like this, which you see here, which you see here. At every level, at every intervertebral level, at every intervertebral level, what will happen is you will see a depression over here. What do you call this? If you remember guys, what do you call this? So this kind of presentation of the spine is what you call as the codfish spine appearance. This is what you call the codfish spine appearance. I hope you remember that. So codfish spine, how will you differentiate it from the rest of the situations? Codfish spine will have the changes diffusely present in all the levels of the vertebra. See, the more down you go because the vertebra lumbar is taking more weight than dorsal. Dorsal vertebra is taking more weight than the cervical area. So these kind of changes will be more prominent where the vertebra is taking more weight. All right. So this is what you call the codfish spine appearance. Uh, so I hope now the screen behind me is very, very clear and everybody is able to like see and analyze. So this is your codfish spine appearance, which is a very, very high possibility of uh, being asked in the exam. All right. Now next one. Next one, when you go to the rickets, right? Rickets and scurvy. So please remember that what do you see, especially in the cases of rickets, a very, very classical deformity like this. Do you recognize this deformity? Can somebody say what deformity is this? Right leg, right leg and the left leg, right and the left leg. So see right leg basically the right leg, the right leg is showing you what deformity? This one is showing you valgus deformity. And if you observe on the left side, it is showing you varus deformity as if some wind is blowing from this side and has swept the legs to opposite side. What do we call this kind of uh, issue? This one is known as the wind swept deformity. This one is known as the wind swept deformity. I hope this is fine, everyone. So, this one is what you call the wind swept deformity. All right. So, valgus and varus, the valgus and varus together. Where do we see the wind swept deformities of legs? Wind swept deformities of legs. It is seen in what condition? It is seen in rickets. Please remember again MCQ and then wind swept deformity of the toes wind swept deformity of the toes where do we see this can anybody say wind swept deformities of the toes it is seen in the cases of rheumatoid arthritis it is seen in the cases of rheumatoid arthritis all right it is seen in cases of rheumatoid arthritis all right okay so this one is rickets now one very very important point the differentiation point between the rickets and the scurvy okay so rickets basically you see the costochondral prominences isn't it the costochondral prominences they are seen in both the situations whether it is curvy or the, whether it is rickets right whether it is curvy or whether it is rickets but now if what is the basic difference between the two situations see the costochondral prominences of rickets they will be painless and the costochondral uh, these prominences of the scurvy they are painful right so these are very very important points which help you to differentiate in your questions whether the child is suffering from rickets or whether the child is suffering from scurvy okay white line of healing white line of healing please remember when you start the treatment for rickets then the white line appears as a part of treatment process but when you see the scurvy patient the white line will already be present over there it will be already present over there and that is known as the white line of frankel it is known as the white line of frankel so white line healing and the white line of frankel all right so this is the difference so costochondral prominence is tender tender scurvy painless rickets that is the biggest difference all right so these are the differentiating uh, pictures between the two situations the white lines and all now osteo malaysia how this question comes to you osteo malaysia how these people come to you they come to you with what you call as the pseudo fractures 
they come to you with what we call as the pseudo fractures which are also known as the loser's zone or which are also known as the milkman's lines all right which are also known as the milkman's lines so pseudo fracture loser zone and the milkman's lines okay so basically what is the most common site where you see this kind of fracture with some callus all around it where do you see this kind of injury where do you see this kind of uh, like trouble most common site would be pubic rami most common site is basically pubic rami followed by the second common site which is the neck of the femur which you are seeing in this particular x-ray right so pseudo fracture patient is not aware of the injury but the x-ray is showing you injury they are doing all their routine work there is no holiday required there is no rest required that's what you call pseudo fracture that would be your case of osteomalacia adult right adult osteogenesis imperfecta if there is a question about this in your exam what will be the typical thing given to you osteogenesis imperfecta typical point will be that a child is presenting to you with fractures which are repeatedly happening fractures which are repeatedly happening okay and you know that in your exam if you have a question about a child getting the fractures repeatedly then there are only two possibilities broadly i am saying there are two possibilities one possibility is osteogenesis imperfecta and other possibility is what you call the battered baby syndrome battered baby syndrome all right what is the basic difference kya hota hai dono mein fark osteogenesis imperfecta and the battered baby syndrome what do you think is the basic difference in these two osteogenesis imperfecta you know the fractures will be healing at a normal pace and then in battered baby the most commonest bone the primary difference you need to understand the most commonest bone affected or getting fractured in battered baby syndrome is humerus the most commonest fracture which happens in osteogenesis imperfecta it is in femur right so blue sclera will be very good very good shraddha is very right that blue sclera will be another absolutely correct finding in the cases of osteogenesis imperfecta and in the cases of battered baby syndrome the child will be very very fearful not looking at you you know everybody around the child will be telling you different kind of story somebody says child fell down from bed somebody says they fell down from chair somebody said no no they were walking and they just fell down so these kind of different kind of stories you will find in the uh, battered baby syndrome right so this is osteogenesis imperfecta please remember this so what is the basic difference between scurvy and oi scurvy was a nutritional problem all right and osteogenesis imperfecta is a genetic problem that is a basic difference okay so pagets if they ask you the question from pagets there is one very very classical important thing that i want you to remember paget disease it comes up with a very very typical vertebra which will be white from all the ends and it will be black in between like this do you remember what do you call this kind of vertebra that is the only thing i want you to remember from pagets all right so what is that this typical kind of uh, vertebra central area black and all around it is white it is known as the picture frame vertebra it is known as the picture frame vertebra what is the other name for this picture frame other name is ivory vertebra picture frame vertebra or ivory vertebra okay picture frame or the ivory vertebra this is very very typical for pagets that's the only thing i want you to remember that it will be a elderly person a problem of the, of the cell cells are you know uh, getting or working more and they are able try to resolve the bone and therefore the child is having or basically this is not a child now this is a adult so paget is basically seen in the adult population it is basically seen in the adult population all right petrosis the last condition which i want you to remember from here it is the marble bone disease right osteopetrosis will be the marble bone disease okay what is the problem in osteopetrosis the clast are defective they are genetically defective and so they are not able to resolve the bone all right so here you have nothing very very classical which is can be asked in the exam so please remember marble bone disease is absolutely white bone absolutely white bone okay so ivory vertebra or picture frame vertebra the box shape or picture frame or whatever you like to call it so these are the different situations which i want you to remember the mcqs from the metabolic disorders okay so typically this is how the vertebras will look like this is how the picture frame vertebra looks like you can all appreciate that so all the four areas margins they are white central area is black and this one you all see these are different features so i want you to remember this one focus here only okay so these are the last moments where we are supposed to focus only on the most important part okay so this is picture frame please remember sometime just to trick you they can also ask one of the most important things here this one that you see the picture number 
is what you have just said as the picture frame or the ivory vertebra isn't it the picture frame or the ivory vertebra look at the next one look at the next one you have this whiteness and whiteness central area black what do you call this kind of spine can somebody say can somebody say what do you call this kind of spine this is known as the rugger jersey spine this is known as what the rugger jersey spine and where do you see the rugger jersey spine it is seen classically it is seen classically in osteopetrosis it can be classically seen in what other condition the renal osteodystrophy the renal osteodystrophy and the third situation where it can be seen is brown's tumor okay so osteopetrosis renal osteodystrophy and the brown's tumor these are the three important situations where you can see a vertebra like this that is rugger jersey spine how to differentiate it from picture frame picture frame is wide from all the four margins rugger jersey is only wide from top and the lower end okay that is the uh, these difference in these two so i told you that all the time guys if they are asking you when does the serum mineralization goes low it is only in one condition that is rickets right every other condition will have the normal parameter increased in only one and that is your brown stube or the hyper para thyroidism right hyper para thyroidism so that is your first part i hope this is fine everyone everyone who is like uh, attending this session i hope this is fine with all okay all right so shall we go the same way for the rest of the topics i hope this is helping you out to revise it okay so let me just open up so let me just open up the second part of this i hope this is going fine guys what do you suggest shall we go the same way okay okay all right so adi akshay med psycho kelly yeah everybody is with me that is so good to see this all right so let me see what will be hiding behind me okay okay so so now i'll be taking up the trauma part trauma is the biggest part of like um, you know orthopedic uh, session and uh, um, there you get many questions based on the presentation of the patient that how the patient will be having the difficulty in a particular kind of uh, like uh, you know uh, the presentation okay let's see what all we have to learn in the trauma okay so please remember the open fractures open fracture how do you classify the open fracture what is a classification used for the open fracture so classification used for open fracture it is gustillo anderson classification it is gustillo anderson classification okay if you remember that gustillo anderson classification that is for the open fractures when the fracture basically when the blood from the fracture side can come out of the skin it is known as a open fracture and the classification will be by gustillo anderson classification all right so whenever there is a open fracture we must remember that whenever there is a open fracture we are having a patient who is at the risk of infection who is at a risk of the infection so open fractures will always have the risk of the infection okay so this is something about here uh, the gustillo anderson or the open fractures now when you are talking about the classification it can be learned like this if you are uh, uh, aware of this all right all right gustillo absolutely correct so in gustillo anderson classification any wound which is less than 1 cm it is considered type 1 any wound which goes more than 1 is type 2 and type 3 is extensive bony damage right comminuted fractures segmental fracture behind me if you can uh, see yeah the picture is very clear periosteal damage the bone is coming out of the skin or if there is a associated vascular injury so like that you divide the gustillo anderson into three types type 1 type 2 and type 3 okay now what are the treatment options these are different things which you must remember i'll show you a certain implants as well so this is a plaster you all can see okay so these are k wires right these are guys if these are given to you in your exams these are k wires you can see both the ends are sharp here k wires right this is how you place the k wires into the bone and this one is a intramedullary nail right it is a intramedullary nail so here we have the flexible nail for the children and here we have the rigid nail so this one the picture that you see is the rigid nail and this one is a flexible nail so rigid nail or the flexible nail okay rigid or the flexible nail all right now next one these are the intramedullary nail so please remember in your exam if by chance they ask you that about the nail so please see this longer nail that you see it is having a angulation here so angulation will be seen all the time into the tibial nail and this one 
is not having any angulation this is only having a curve so whenever any nail long or short is only having a curve it is made for femur right so tibial nail will have a angulation and the femoral nail will have the curves okay so this is one these are all the placement of the intermedial nail this is how a plate looks like this is how the plate looks like so what is the name for this plate what do you call this plate this is known as the dynamic compression plate the first one is dynamic compression plate and this plate that you see it is known as lcdcp now what is that l and c l and c is low or limited that is limited contact dcp that would be limited contact dynamic compression plate why are we calling it uh, limited contact because see the extra margins of the plate they have been removed right they have been removed so that when you put the plate over the bone the whole plate is not on the bone right the whole plate should not be onto the bone it is not required because it will do unnecessary periosteal damage okay all right i hope this is fine let's see the next picture we have these are the different external fixators which you should be very well aware about this one is what can somebody name the first external fixator you see is what you call as elizaro okay this is what you call elizaro second one if a picture comes to you like this the first one is elizaro second one is lrs limb reconstruction system okay lrs or this one is rod and clamp this one behind me on the top of my like head area you can see these are simply the rods and clamps okay these are the simplest ones so rod and clamps lrs lrs or the rail fixator lrs or the rail fixator okay so these are like different kind of external fixators we have okay so please don't mark them wrong if they are coming in your exams okay so glasgow comma scale why do we use glasgow comma scale so you should know about glasgow comma scale that you are using it for neurological status of the patient to know about the neurological status of the patient all right that is for neurological status of the patient now in the shoulder what are the important things so please remember in your exams if they are giving you a scenario that patient is not able to do a particular problem then you must be very very clear that what can be the issue with the patient for example if the question says the patient is not able to start or do the initiation beginning of abduction if he is not able to begin the abduction then what is the trouble that means 0 to 15 degrees is done by supraspinatus what can happen to it either it is a complete tear or it is a suprascapular nerve palsy only two things if the question says the patient is able to initiate it but then he cannot continue it 15 to 90 degree then this is very very important what do you call this 15 to 90 degree problem will be related to what it is related to a deltoid it is related to the deltoid okay uh let me just yeah yeah so whenever there is a problem in 15 to 90 we know that problem is with deltoid and deltoid can have what either the deltoid is torn or there is a axillary nerve injury this is very very important all right and if there is a 60 to 120 degree problem patient is trying to abduct and abduct here till here there is no pain now the pain start it is all painful all painful all painful all painful and now the pain disappears so 16 to 120 degrees is another question of your exam that is known as the painful arc syndrome all right that is known as what painful arc syndrome so what are the possible causes for painful arc syndrome you can see them very well behind me most common culprit all the time is supraspinatus most common culprit is supraspinatus okay so what the supraspinatus can have it can have a tear it can have a calcification it can have a tendinitis okay all the three important things so please highlight it and remember it what your patient is having the problem in initiation supraspinatus 15 to 90 deltoid 16 to 120 painful arc very very important question for the exam all right next one if the patient is having a problem in internally rotating internally rotating the limb the problem is with subscapularis okay subscapularis how to check for that the ask the patient to keep the hand on the lower back ask the patient to keep the hand on the lower back that is your internal rotation subscapularis and another very very important question for the exam that patient is not able to do external rotation patient is not able to do external rotation so if they are not able to do external rotation the problem is with teres minor or the infraspinatus teres minor or the infraspinatus all right so again what is the trouble if understand this very very logically if in your exam they say that patient cannot do it cannot do it that means there is a tear to both the muscle 
both the muscles are getting nerve supply from different nerves so if there is a absolute absence of external rotation that means there is a injury to what rotator cuff that's a trauma and if there is a problem or you can say weakness if partial possibility is there then either axillary is damaged or subscapularis is damaged right not subscapularis basically the suprascapular the the suprascapular nerve okay the supra scapular nerve like that so most commonly asked will be your axillary most commonly asked will be axillary all right i hope all are with me on this all are with me on this these are very very logical points so try not to muck them up don't try to muck them up try to understand what is the problem if the question is mentioning that the patient is having a trouble in particular movement okay now see this is okay all right so if the patient is coming to you another mcq for the exam if the patient is coming to you with the attitude how abduction and external rotation what is that abduction and external rotation like this then what will be the most likely diagnosis in your exam it will be anterior dislocation of the shoulder and if the patient is coming to you with a hand held like that abducted internal rotated it can be very well a, uh, like question on the posterior dislocation of the uh, shoulder now two important points i want to highlight again for your mcq for your exams that what is the most commonest method used to reduce anterior dislocation of the shoulder it is cocker's method team steps are team what is a team stands for t is for traction external rotation adduction and medial rotation traction external rotation adduction and medial rotation okay contour if it is maintained contour usually is maintained and still you are talking about dislocation if the contour of the shoulder is maintained and you are still talking about the dislocation then you are talking about again posterior dislocation okay so posterior dislocation will have the contour maintained anterior one will have will be reduced by cocker's method two most important questions all right next see this should be what diagnosis can somebody say this person comes to me he came to me with history that he was holding a bar in the metro and then suddenly a jerk happened on the shoulder and then he had like this kind of posture in the shoulder area so can you say that like what is the problem to this patient why he is keeping the hand like this is it anterior dislocation or the posterior dislocation can somebody say like that anyone so this is the anterior dislocation of the shoulder this one is anterior dislocation of the shoulder because the contour is lost okay and contour being maintained is a feature of posterior dislocation of the shoulder all right so what are the different areas where different nerves can be involved that's again very very important what are the different areas where different nerves can be involved so this is another possible mcq for our exam gains canal ulnar nerve so out of all these lists that you see behind me the most important one i want you to remember for your exams now one is the carpal tunnel carpal tunnel which now the median nerve right second head of radius montegia which now posterior interosseous nerve humerus lateral condyle don't get confused humerus lateral condyle usually the injury is here the bone but it will involve the nerve of this side but that's not immediate that will be too late that will be very very late that is why you are calling it tardy ulnar nerve plc third important question okay third important question fourth important is like supracondylar fractures what is the most commonest nerve injury that will happen here ain you know that it is a branch of which nerve it is a branch of median nerve it is a branch of median nerve all right ain shaft of humerus it is a radial nerve so let me here only tell you that what will be the presentation and how do you test them that's very very important okay so ain how do you test the anterior interosseous nerve it is being tested by something called the okay sign ask the patient to flex the thumb flexor pollicis longus and flexor digitorum profundus fdp and fpl here so if the patient can do this ain is all right shaft of humerus if the radial is gone you know what will happen wrist drop finger drop loss of sensation okay so there will be a wrist drop <clears throat> there will be a finger drop and there will be loss of sensation okay if the axillary proximal humerus number 5 is shaft number 6 proximal humerus if axillary is gone i told you axillary is deltoid 15 to 90 and external rotation right so both action will be lost okay after that you have the most important nerve the posterior dislocation of the hip area sciatic nerve which will lead to what foot drop which will lead to what foot drop very high possibilities of being asked in your upcoming exam is proximal fibula so please remember in the proximal fibula around the neck of fibula it is involvement of the cpn which will again cause a foot drop cpn is what common peroneal nerve 
CPN would be common peroneal nerve. All right. So these are the eight areas which I want you to remember that nerves, the areas which will be involving these nerves. All right. So this is very, very important. This is very, very important. All right. So that's your fractures and the associated nerves. Okay. Next one, these are all the areas which I just told you that how it happens. Okay. So AIN, proximal humerus and all these areas. So this is very, very, very important aspect of the trauma involving the nerve. Now, when you are coming out of the nerve, very important question which has been asked in your previous year exams and has a potential of being asked again is the classification of the nerve injury. So please remember that we have got two types of classifications. One is what you call as Seddon's classification. One is what you call as Seddon's classification. And other one is what you call as Sutherland classification. Right? How did Seddon's divide uh, uh, this uh, nerve injury? Neuroprexia. Neuroprexia is just a physiological conduction block. Neuroprexia, it is just a physiological conduction block. Okay? It is just a physiological conduction block. Physiological conduction block. What does that mean? Any example we know for that? The most commonest example is the Saturday night pilsi. Alright? That is Saturday night pilsi. So if somebody asks you in Saturday night that will he recover or not recover? We know 100% is going to recover. The question, very, very important is this neuroprexia. Second important question is exontemesis, right? What is that exontemesis? Exontemesis means injury to this exon, injury to this exon. So when the injury has happened around the exon, you know, to the exon, the sheet around this exon, this outermost covering of the exon here is known as endoneurium. So this may be injured, the sheet may be injured, may not be injured. Very important question I'm telling you is a potential question for your exams that what is the grade of injury? What is the grade of injury when the nerve is injured but nerve sheet is intact? Grade of injury when the nerve is injured but the sheet is intact. The sheet is intact. So what is the grade of injury? It is exontemesis. Very, very classical. So injury in real is there. But no sheet is damaged because nerve has got three sheets. Outermost is what you call epineurium. Perineurium is around this bundle, that is a fascicle. Endoneurium is around the exon. So all the three sheets are all right, but still the nerve is injured, that is exontemesis. Okay, so please remember these two are most potential questions for our exam. One is the prexia, physiological conduction block, or the second exontemesis. All right, I hope it is fine with all. So this is the very important question okay let's see the next one yeah let's see now coming on to the the splints of the nerve so this one where the knuckles are being bent this splint where the knuckles are being bent to straighten the finger like this this one is known as the knuckle bender splint this is known as the knuckle bender splint where do we use knuckle bender splint anyone so knuckle bender will be used in what conditions when there is a situation of claw hand, ulnar claw, median claw, whatever it is. So you will be using the knuckle bender splint. All right. And whenever somebody has got a wrist drop like that, somebody has got a wrist drop like that. So you are supposed to elevate and keep the wrist elevated. That is why you are calling these kind of splintages as the cock up splint. You call these kind of splintages as the cock up splint. So cock up splint is what? Cock up splint is when you have to keep the limb elevated. Now you see this one is a static kind of splint static means no changes will be done whatsoever it may be right and if you see there is a spring attached to it that is why it is known as dynamic splint again i am telling you this is a very very potential question for your exam very potential question for your exam the dynamic or the static so upper one is the static splint that means it is there if it is supposed to be there it is there right fixed means fixed no change dynamic means which can be mobilized dynamic means which can be mobilized okay so this is these are the different kind of splints which you can use for different kind of injuries so please remember this table it is very very important thomas splint why do we use i'll show you the pictures as well fracture femur shaft of the femur it is for femur shaft basically dennis brown has been a question in your previous year exam used for ctv mermaid very very commonly used splint in rickets Cock up, I just showed you, knuckle bender, I have just shown you, aeroplane splint. The arm of the patient is like this. That is for the brachial plexus injury. Taylor's, I have shown you already with osteoporosis. 
dorsal lumbar immobilization and milwaukee brace is for scoliosis let's see all the pictures so this one is which splint if you can say this one is which one it is thomas splint okay shaft of femur mermaid for rickets mermaid for rickets third one for scoliosis this one is what you call milwaukee okay this one is what you call milwaukee this one is aeroplane splint that is aeroplane and this one a uh, question of your previous year again uh, can be asked dennis brown splint so this is dennis brown splint this is aeroplane splint this one is the mermaid splint for rickets and this one is milwaukee right this one is milwaukee all right so these are the different splints to be used okay now the clinical test around the nerve injuries you must remember these three tests okay so one is what you call the ruse test what is that ask the patient to abduct and extend the uh, shoulder area and keep on closing and opening the finger why are we doing this ruse or the adsen two most important test these are been done for thoracic outlet syndrome these are been done for thoracic outlet syndrome so whenever the subclavian vessel whenever the subclavian vessel is compromised whenever the subclavian vessel is compromised then we do these two tests the ruse please remember the name the ruse and the adsen test okay the ruse and the adsen test they are very very important they are very very important this ruse i would say is a potential question for the exams again okay so list of the clinical tests let me put the list of the clinical tests that we do at different places for different kind of conditions okay so one by one i'll explain all of them and i'll mark the most important potentials for your exam first most important i said is carpal tunnel all right first one is carpal tunnel okay yeah the first one is carpal tunnel please remember the durkan test the most sensitive test durkan would be the most sensitive test for the nerve injury it is the most sensitive test for the carpal tunnel syndrome that is a median nerve so when you compress when you compress you know directly onto the median nerve that will produce a tingling in the hand of the patient that's what you call the durkan test all right de kervain finkelstein de kervain stenosynovitis remember finkelstein test ask the patient to keep the thumb in the fist and go down like this so what are the in the what are the uh, muscles which get inflamed that is abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis your potential question number 2 okay so these two tendons that you can see here at the base of the thumb they can be in involved tennis elbow cousin test the lateral epicondylitis subscapular is the lift off test where you can ask the patient to keep the hand on the lower back and ask him to lift it against the uh, some resistance okay supraspinatus empty can as the patient you know flex the shoulder here keep the elbow extended and just you know try to push the hand down that is a empty can test anterior dislocation test anterior dislocation would be okay anterior dislocation would be dugas hamilton ruler test and cavez these are classical thing dugas will be ask the patient to touch the opposite shoulder that is one that is a dugas test hamilton ruler test is putting a scale here uh, putting a scale here and that would be touching the acromion and the lateral condyle at the same time okay then thoracic outlet i told you this is having a one potential you know uh, question for the exam for scoliosis not that important adams test you ask the patient to stand straight and bend forward like that okay you see if this scoliosis persists or disappears ankylosing spondylitis um, uh, not that yeah thomas test for the fixed flexion deformity thomas test is a very very important one how to do it you should know the name of the test that is a thomas test okay so these are the ones and then definitely for the cruciates and the menisci for cruciate what we do is anterior and the posterior draw test anterior and the posterior draw test all right so this is this is the these are the different tests which i want you to remember these are the different tests and definitely about the cdh when we talk about the congenital dislocation of the hip you can also see the alles barlos or the autonomy so i would say number 5 and number 6 i want you to remember these six by heart okay these six tests by heart so uh, these are very potential areas the questions which can be there in your exams all right now coming on to the important fractures what are the important fractures so what about this deformity if somebody comes to you with this kind of deformity can somebody name what is the deformity here what is the deformity here that is cubitus varus where do you see this supracondylar humerus okay that is supracondylar humerus like that and if there is a lateral condyle what do we see the non union fracture of necessity and what is the deformity here in lateral condyle it would be valgus it would be valgus so lateral condyle valgus please remember valgus varus so this one supracondylar will have the varus abnormality 
okay supracondylar fractures most commonest complication is malunion lateral condyle the most commonest complication is non union the most commonest is non union all right so please remember lateral condyle are always supposed to be fixed they are always supposed to be fixed you have to put the wires here k wires to fix it okay policemen's no what are you saying that is not policemen's this one is only varus deformity see the elbow joint is involved so what do we call it cubitus the first word has to be cubitus and the forearm is going medially that is why we are calling it varus okay so cubitus varus it is seen in supracondylar injuries okay so that is a supracondylar and lateral condyle two very very potential questions for your exam lateral condyle supracondylar okay very important so this is one child who is having blister formation can you see the compartment syndrome supracondylar also produces compartment syndrome compartment syndrome but please remember supracondylar is not the most commonest fracture to produce compartment syndrome it is a fracture diaphysis of tibia it is the fracture diaphysis of tibia the most commonest and after what pressure you say that it is going into dangerous uh, like uh, uh, value it is more than 30 mm of mercury right that would be 30 mm of mercury so diaphysis of tibia and the most important or you can say the first sign which tells you that it is going into compartment syndrome it is the pain on passive stitch it is pain on passive stitch all right the pain on passive stitch and as a part of treatment of compartment syndrome please remember we have to go for fasciotomy and this fasciotomy has to be superficial plus deep both the fascias have to be resected all right so supracondylar fractures these are the questions related to it so lateral condyle this is how it happens if you don't treat them they will get displaced all right named angles in orthopedics named angles in orthopedics so these are different angles which are seen at different locations please remember them bowmans at elbow cobs at spine in the cases of scoliosis okay bowlers and gisen at calcaneum mere and kites basically these are seen in ctvs okay so ctv these are the angles please remember the names another area for your question is all right let's see the next one so have, this is bowmans this is cobs then you have this bowlers or gisen and then we have the kites angle or the mere angle okay so this is very very important to know the names even if you don't know how to draw them it's all right remember the names names are very very important okay this is something called as the fish tail deformity fish tail like the tail of the fish so lower humerus will have the absorption like that okay elbow dislocation not that very very important but yes there is one potential question here that in elbow dislocation what do you understand by terrible triad of elbow so terrible triad means three things elbow dislocation fracture of coronoid and fracture of the radial head so three important things three important things okay hodgkin's terrible triad hodgkin's terrible triad means three important things happening together so you can very well appreciate this x ray which i am just showing you see there is a chunk of the coronoid here there is a chunk coming from the radial head here and elbow is already dislocated so these are terrible triad of the elbow okay so this was the patient's uh, uh, ct report this another one very very important one this is another very very important one this is what you call montegia fracture of medial bone that is ulna and the dislocation of the radial head okay medial bone ulna and the dislocation of the radial head that is montegia and the opposite of this will be galaxy opposite of this will be galaxy see the distal one third of the radius and the ulna getting subluxated or dislocated so this one is galaxy galaxy is the lateral bone fracture montegia is the medial bone fracture montegia is medial bone galaxy is lateral bone all right very very important question distal end of radius two important fractures here two important fractures here see there are four fractures so first one that you see is smith second one that you see is coley's how do i differentiate these are extra articular injury these two are extra articular see this is the shadow of the thumb this is the shadow of the thumb if the distal part is towards the thumb here then it means it is smith distal part is on the back side of the fingers then it is coley's distal or you can say the distal fragment going on the dorsal displacement is coley's palmar displacement is smith okay so distal fragment going on the palmar side or dorsal side the smith and coley's all right now if you see intraarticular injuries if you see intraarticular injuries joint area is getting damaged the joint area is getting damaged okay that is intraarticular injury 
So this one, if you see other one, this is what you call the fracture of the radial styloid. The fracture of the radial styloid. So third one, the third injury is Barton. Barton is intraarticular, and the fourth fracture is here. That is known as Schoffer. Schoffer is defined as how the radial styloid. Okay, the Smith. Palmer displacement, Coley's dorsal displacement, Barton, intraarticular injury, and Schoffer is the fracture of the radial styloid. Okay, what is that? B and M K. I don't know. Here, anyhow. Okay, so these are the different injuries. So this is a deformity. What do you call this deformity? The dinner fork. Where do we see this dinner fork? It is seen in the cases of Coley's injury. Right. That will be seen in the case of Coley's injury. And this one is Smith. This one is Smith. That is Garden Spay. So Coley's dinner fork, Coley's dinner fork, and Smith the garden spade deformity. All right. Now next one we have is the scaphoid fracture. Please remember it is the most commonest carpal to get fracture. Okay, it is the most commonest carpal to get fracture, and the blood supply comes like this. So most commonest carpal to get fractured and necrosis. The most common site of necrosis will be proximal pole. This area, right? It is a proximal pole. Please remember most important point. Okay. MRI. These are the just investigations for the MRI part. Not that relevant for the exam part. Lunate. Please remember, is the most common carpal to dislocate. Lunate is the most common carpal to dislocate. When the lunate dislocates, it shows us a sign like this. It shows us a sign like this, which is known as the Terry Thomas sign. So where do you see Terry Thomas sign? Terry Thomas sign is seen in scapholunate dissociation. It is seen in scapholunate dissociation. All right. And then you have the thumb injuries. Thumb injuries are uh, this one is the two fractures which occur at the base of the thumb. One is what you call Bennett. This one is Bennett. Okay, Bennett at the thumb. And then you have a comminuted fracture also is there. The picture of which is somewhat similar to this one. Okay, this is known as Rolando. Rolando is comminuted fracture. Bennett is a partial intraarticular fracture. Boxers would be neck of the fifth metacarpal. Neck of the fifth metacarpal. Okay, so these are all your injuries of the upper limb. When you talk about the injuries of the spine, I have one, uh, not exactly the spinal area. Uh, yeah, this one, this brace. And when you talk about the conditions of the spine, this is something you should be aware of. What is this? These are the brace supports. I told you already. What is this? The Milwaukee, Milwaukee for scoliosis. That's very very important. Okay, that's very very important. And when you talk about the lower limb now, when you talk about the lower limb now, the most important part in the lower limb is again similar to your shoulder, right? Lower limb, the attitude of the limb. See, whenever a patient comes to you with the abducted and externally rotated attitude like this, most likely it is having only two situations. One is the anterior dislocation of the hip, which is very very important topic, dislocation of the hip, and second is synovitis. Synovitis can be because of multiple reasons: TB stage one, parthi, septic arthritis, like that. This is what you call the Parthes disease, right? The Parthes disease. It was just a small kid, and these are all the you know tuberculosis, necrotic foci. You can see which are happening, and gradually the head is getting absorbed. This is tuberculosis, advanced tuberculosis. All right. So adduction and internally rotated. This kind of hip will be seen in what? The most potential question from the hip area for your exams. Posterior dislocation of the hip, and with the posterior dislocation of the hip. There is one very very important sign related that is known as vascular sign of Narrath. Vascular sign of Narrath. What is that? Vascular sign of Narrath that you will not be able to feel the femoral pulsations. You will not be able to feel the femoral pulsations. That is your vascular sign of Narrath. That's vascular sign of Narrath. Seen where in posterior dislocation. How is the hip adducted and internally rotated? Okay. So these are the attitudes of the hip in these situations. This one is another situation where you have the attitude of the hip in adduction and external rotation. Adduction and external rotation is seen only in two situations: SCFE, where the epiphysis has slipped from the rest of the bone, or the Parthes disease, or the Parthes disease. So please remember the attitude of the hip. Okay, so these are different uh, different osteochondritis, where the bone gets necrotic. Right, these are different osteochondritis where the bone becomes necrotic. What are the different osteochondritis we have? So, preserves, preserves is scaphoid. Lunate is kinbok. Okay, lunate is kinbok. See this one, the picture here. It is a osteonecrosis of the lunate bone, basically kinbok. Okay, and then you have panels at capitulum, Schuerman, Schuerman and Cave, Schuerman and Cave in vertebra. Then we have the parthes, head of femur, 
osteochondritis dissecans in the femoral area, SLJ syndrome in patella, Osgood Schlatter is one very very important topic here that is uh, tibial tubercle or tuberosity basically, island disease or the Freiburg disease, island or Freiburg, island will be fifth metatarsal base, Freiburg is second metatarsal head. Most important out of these would be I would say Parthes and Osgood Schlatter, third kind of, I would say these are three most important for our exam, okay. Okay, all right. Okay, so Kohler's navicular and Sievers, Sievers like this, chondritis on the back of the calcaneum, that is Sievers osteochondritis. Okay, TB hip, whenever there is a TB hip, you know that most common foci of infection will be acetabulum. And the test to be done, I told you already the important, uh, you know, question, it is Thomas test. All right, so this is very, very important. Friction neck femur, it is all about managing the patient with the age. Any patient who is more than above 65, the treatment plan is replacement. And less than 65, we have to save the head. So if the injury is intracapsular, we can very well fix it by CC screw. And if it is extra capsular, we can fix it by DHS. But if the injury, the patient comes to you late, we can give Mayer's pedicle graft. Mayer's pedicle graft uses what muscle? That is another question. That is quadratus femoris. It is quadratus femoris. Very important question. Please mark it or highlight it. Quadratus femoris, quadratus femoris, all right. That is neck of femur. And then you have these all procedures being done. All right. So let's see what next we have after this. Uh, yeah, we have certain pictures to show you. This one, what do you see? What do you see here? What do you call this kind of uh, support? This is gallows traction. Please remember, it can be very well an image based question. That is a gallows traction used for fracture shaft of the femur in a child. All right picture shaft of the femur in a child and then you have this kind of picture it is known as what the hip spica where do we use hip spica in any child less than five years of age for fracture shaft again okay in any child less than five the fracture shaft of femur we can use that gallows will be used in any child less than two years of age any child less than two years of age we can use gallows all right then you have the patella the injury of the patella if there is a patient like this injury of patella we can very well do what procedure that will be one peripotential question so two part fracture of patella two part fracture of patella will be treated by tension band wiring will be treated by tension band wiring all right so these are the screw and all which has been placed okay and then this is the test i am sitting on the foot of the patient i am trying to pull the tibia anteriorly what are we doing this is the draw test anterior draw and the posterior draw all right so these are all the eponyms eponyms uh, you can learn what do you call different eponyms this is how you give the skin traction i would like to show you this is how you give the skin traction the commonest normal skin traction is known as buck's traction buck's traction okay buck's traction is what skin traction for skeletal traction very important question again if you want to give the skeletal traction what all you have to give so one, Stinman pin can be used. Second, Denham's pin can be used. And third structure required is the Bowler stirrup. This is Bowler, B-O-H-L-E-R. That is Bowler stirrup. Okay, Bowler stirrup. All right, Stinman pin, the Denham pin and the Bowler stirrup. This is how it is used. The pin is through the bone and then we apply a traction through it. All right. So these are different ones. Barton is not that important for us. These are not that important. So that was my part two. Okay, that was my part two. And I'll be using another, I'll be showing you another part three as well. So basically, this is one picture, guys, which I have uh, like on my Telegram group, on the DBMC primary group and my Telegram group as well. So you can go and download this kind of picture which I have drawn. And in the picture, I've shown that at what all areas, what all tumors are very, very common. All right at what area what tumor is very very common so you can download this picture and i'll show you certain very very important tumors like the most important one i want to show you is a giant cell tumor see this is how the giant cell will look like epiphyseal area epiphyseal area and so bubble it is nothing else than gct anytime any tumor is given to you please remember this anytime any uh, tumor is given to this you have given to you the first thing to be always seen is the location of the tumor right it is a location of the tumor and then see the special feature if you are able to appreciate anything in the uh, picture so all the 
all the time the location will be the most important key for you to identify whether it is epiphyseal, metaphyseal or diaphyseal. That will be the key to identify the lesion. Alright. Okay. So, giant cell tumor. Then we have, uh, yeah, this one. Then we have these two tumors which I want to show you. This one will be the sunburst appearance. Cordman's triangle in the picture number two. And this is what you call the onion peel or the laminated appearance. Alright. So, these are three most important, three most important ones. The sunburst appearance, the cordman's triangle and the onion peel appearance or the laminated appearance. Right. Onion peel appearance, laminated, having sarcoma. Okay. So, these are the ones and now let me show you about the infection. I want to show you this very, very classical picture which is of chronic osteomyelitis. Right. The chronic osteomyelitis picture. So, in the chronic osteomyelitis, the central part, if it is given to you in the exam, it will be the sequestrum. All right. That would be sequestrum. This area is what you call sequestrum. Dead bone. Whiteness all around it is what you call involucrum. And this area from where the bone perforates is known as cloaca. So, sequestrum, involucrum and cloaca. Okay. So, when you remove all this dead material, you will keep on scratching the bone and the bone will be showing you multiple bleeding points. Multiple bleeding point is what you call as the paprika sign. Multiple bleeding point is what you call the paprika sign. Okay. Paprika. P-A-P-A-R-I-K-A. -A -A, paprika. Paprika sign. Okay. So, paprika sign will be a hallmark for chronic osteomyelitis. Please remember that. Alright. Now, in the joint disorders, I would like to show you certain images. This is what you call as the bamboo spine appearance behind me. You can very well appreciate that. Bamboo spine appearance. Classically seen where? In ankylosing spondylitis. Alright. These are the deformities which can be seen in different arthropathies. So, this one is swan neck and this one is botunier. Where do we see that? In rheumatoid arthritis. And here in OA, in osteoarthritis, we can have the destructive arthropathies of the DIP as well as the PIP. Right? So, please remember whenever there is a case of RA, the DIP is not involved. The DIP is not involved. But in OA, the DIP and PIP both can be involved. DIP, PIP both can be involved. Alright? So, that is your osteoarthritis. That would be osteoarthritis. So, RA, DIP is not involved. Okay? So, this is classical rheumatoid, AS and all. Yeah. So, reactic arthritis also I can show you. That they show you something like this classical which is known as the pencil in a cup appearance. So, psoriatic arthritis, pencil in a cup appearance. Alright? And then in the... Uh, CDH, I told you about these two splints, congenital dislocation of the hip. I told you the test to be done, R3, I have already highlighted the test. Alice, Alice was like this, this is Alice, Barlow's and Ortolone. So, Barlow's is trying to dislocate the hip yourself. Okay, and these are the splint to be used for CDH. This one is what you call the splint, that is Von Rosen splint and it is the harness. It is harness, this one is harness. Both are being used for congenital dislocation of the hip. Please remember this. Okay, harness. And this is what you call the CTV. That's what you call the CTV. So, you must remember in CTV that inversion occurs at telocalcaneal area. Right? Equinus at tibiotalar joint. Four foot adduction, it is at telonavicular joint. So, please remember the names and the inversion. Inversion is one of the questions which can be asked to you. Other than that, you talk about the Dennis Brown splint. So, this is Dennis Brown splint. Two shoes. Two shoes connected to each other by a bar. Right? Two shoes connected to each other by a bar. That is a Dennis Brown split. Alright? And this is the deformity. If you don't treat the CTV well, this is the deformity the foot will get. It is known as the rocker bottom foot. See, the lower end of the swinging chair. The rocker bottom foot. So, broadly, yeah. So, broadly, I have covered up everything. And this is some very, very good video which I found on the net. That whenever the life is troubling, you know, Whenever the life is troubling you like this, just not to get panicked and enjoy. Right? Enjoy. So, this is our time. We can do the best utilization of it. And I am very, very sure that you all are very much prepared. It is all about just getting mentally stronger. Okay? It is all about just getting little mentally stronger. So, this is the all crux uh, that we have. I have uh, for you for the FMG exam. Upcoming one. So, uh, I hope that we have been able to revise all the previous year questions by the means of this rapid revision in this one, one and a half hour like kind of uh, session, one hour or 10, 15 minutes that we have taken. So, I think I have covered up almost every everything. All right. So, just uh, stay focused, stay determined, stay positive and you are surely going to achieve it. That's my like, uh, you know, uh, surety to you. 
so uh, all the very best from my side and at dbmci we are committed to give you the best of the support we can all right so i'll be waiting to hear from you after your result comes and i wish you all very very best all right thank you so much everyone for being a part of the session enjoy stay hopeful and keep smiling